Hi, I'm Menaka and I'm live at the IP studio with Amulya Narayan, 25 by 25 grantee. Yesterday, when we were trying to record Amulya's uh, session, we had internet, internet interruptions on three occasions and we failed to record the session. So here we have her, but we have the pleasure of having her in the studio with us. And uh, it's ironic because uh, Amulya's grant is about looking at a dystopic science fiction science fi future where we where she imagines a world uh, with the absence of the internet. Amulya is a writer, playwright, um, singer songwriter, and her project is called Stages of Grief. I will now invite Amulya to share a little bit about her project and her process. Thank you. Thank you so much, Milka. Lovely to be here yeah. at the IIT office. Uh, so yes, I, I took up this thought experiment uh, initially when I made the proposal to IFA about a world in which there is no internet because I thought we have to examine our relationship with a thing on uh, with something that is such a integral part of our lives, such a significant part of our lives, and we we don't really control how a lot of the part of how it comes to us, how how it has become so integral to our lives. So I think it's always important to evaluate your relationship with something like that. And um, I, I guess one way of doing that is to see what would what you would do in, in the in its absence. You know, if you suddenly lost the thing that is so important to you, what would happen to you? So this took me to looking into like narratives of loss. So in psychology, there is this concept of the stages of grief by Elizabeth and David Kubler Ross. So uh, these stages, I mean, not, not everyone experiences them in a linear fashion necessarily, nor does everyone al always experience each stage, but it's an interesting concept around which I, decide, which I, used, which I decided to use as a writing device. Yeah. So I, uh, me along with my uh, collaborator, uh, Bhavna Rao, we came up with uh, four stories, basically with four protagonists who, are, uh, who, have, uh, who have had some connection or rather who are getting something that's really important to them from the internet, maybe a source of income, maybe, uh, maybe information, maybe right. connection. And uh, these, uh, their stories unfold at different timelines from the event of the internet being cut off. And in my, in my, uh, uh, I mean, in this project, the reason for the reason why the internet was cut off is not of much consequence. But of course, if it happened in the real world, I think yeah. it would be a very important True. question to ask. Uh, so, I could I could just take you through some of the, this PPT, uh, which has some of my visual uh, inspirations and you know some of the it's kind of like a mood yeah. board. And I think it's really interesting just to add before you take us to that. that we're so attached to our devices today, right? And I think, and that's why I think this project also uh, interested us because we're so attached to our devices, and you know, your battery dies, and for two hours you don't have access to yeah. things, and you know, you, your whole world changed. So I can't even imagine a world where there's no internet. So, yeah. yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, it's called it's called the five stages of grief. Quite a, a self-explanatory title. Uh, so the, 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 there is a sort of prologue. Um, oh, by the way, all of these stories are available for listening on SoundCloud. Uh, and so there's a prologue uh, where I set up the, uh, the scene at, of the moment when the internet gets cut off. And uh, then we go on to, um, we go on to the first story, which is called, it isn't what it is. Uh, the protagonist is Kari, she's an influencer. So she's also had to, struggle a lot at home uh, to, you know, to, to live life on her, her own terms. So she gets also her sense of self from the internet because she, she really created her own personality through social media. And so what happens to her? So uh, she's, she's going through what we call denial. She's in denial mode. And uh, what she does is she ends up, you know, chronicling her feelings and we see her neurosis getting worse and worse through some, some vlogs that she maintains for her followers, which she hopes they will see uh, right. once the internet is back. So she's still in kind of denial mode. And then uh, we have, if we could just, so uh, this is, these are some of uh, Kari's posts and uh, you, you'll, you'll also see her friend, uh, Billy's profile. So Billy is someone who is coping pretty well with the, uh, with the, with, with the situation, but Kari is not. So they kind of, uh, you know, the, the story plays out in two directions. 
and i guess she also reconciles yeah. perhaps uh, some certain relationships maybe she, maybe she has to reimagine her uh, life and her future uh this other story uh, this is about a girl called hedge and uh, we we used the device of bargaining here mm-hmm. so bargaining in psychology i mean when you're talking about loss it's somebody who's so unable to come to terms with that loss right. so they say i mean they feel like they they could offer anything that they have in order to get back you know they 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 try to make a pact with god they're like if i if i you know if, if you know someone if if somebody is is uh, close to you is very unwell maybe you'll tell god okay i'll give up this for some time and so she's also she's she's woken up uh, from a coma after a long you know uh, uh, she's had an accident she's woken up from a coma and she's woken up into this world and uh, she's like it's kind of like an addiction that she has to get over she's because um, the bargaining part it, is it it appears kind of desperate where she's like anything i'll give you anything just give me like switch, switch on the wifi for a little bit uh and then we have yeah so this is a letter she writes to one of her friends this story is called uh, shame and its friends this is uh, the third part of the series and uh, uh it's set well in the future and uh, we it's set well in the future and uh, the the story of the i mean the event of the internet going off has been turned into a kind of myth and uh, the emotion that we are dealing with here is anger so there is something that uh, he he cannot forget from his past and uh, he also of course mourns the loss of the internet and the fact that you know his students can't now learn the truth about their past because this, there's a state sanctioned truth as well so you know he's battling these things internally and externally and there's a kind of blow out event uh, which yeah so the, this is kind of like a mood board to say protests uh, they're not allowed to talk about the protests there are of course protests why because they want to know what happened to the internet and i thought there was an interesting piece in the story where um, they're looking at news pieces that are 3 months old yes. because there is no internet to have instant access yes, to things yes yes right yeah so this is there's a, the myth of the great net yeah. where they he says yeah the, apparently they believed in this internet thing where you could talk to anyone and his students believe it because right. they also have no way to verify now they there, there are no fact checking sources right. and there's a student protester who he sort of memorializes uh, and this was again like kind of a inspiration this story uh, is this is the fourth story in the series the final story and uh, actually the character was inspired by someone i met recently on my travels uh, a woman who is uh, all by herself running this uh, little lodging place in the himalayas in, in uttarakhand um, she's she's been running this since her parents passed away uh, her husband is abroad somewhere and uh, she's all alone and she's had to fight off a lot of things and um, i just imagined what would happen you know if she lost the connection to all the people that she that are in her in her past and you know the people who have made her what she is and this uh, the, the emotion that we that i took for this was depression and uh, so this is this is the story i would like to read for you today sure uh, uh so uh, amanya is going to read from her, from this particular story but before you do i know that you put all these stories together in uh, collaboration with bhavna yeah so i would love to know a little bit about that process of how you went about um, gathering or, or you know reflecting on this okay so bhavna and i are friends also uh, she uh, she's an architect and uh, we we started just discussing this project uh, based on what my proposal had been and it's come a little uh, some way from the proposal it's changed form in 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 some in, in terms of the format of presentation and in the idea uh, but it still retained some the grain of the the uh, idea so what we did was we uh, we we started having this discussion about uh, you know the absence and the loss and uh, we we wondered whether we should take it technical and have it like you know an arthur c clark kind of thing mm-hmm. or maybe something more uh, i don't know if you're familiar with jose saramago he writes these stories where i mean like there's an event and then he examines the human um, response to that and how you know who we find we find out who we are through our response to this kind of event and it is very interesting to look at this uh, event through those through that lens 
and uh, what we did was we uh, we decided that uh, we would use this this writing device of the stages of grief so it was either going to be in one story or like in a few short uh, different stories and uh, that happened through the writing process we thought we wondered first if we should uh, have all these characters in the different stages within one story or you know just in, but then we thought maybe we should explore different timelines as well because it's we also want to see how the event has had its you know effects much later on or very soon right after the event so we took that freedom and uh, and we 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 wrote we we, we took the we split the emotions between each other and uh, she wrote two stories uh, and i wrote I mean, we drafted two stories each and then we exchanged and then we edited each other's work discussed it further and yeah that's the uh, that was our process thanks thanks for sharing i don't want to, I, i would love for you to share read for us uh, so i think i think today we'll be presenting amulya as last as the last project for the day it's 25 by 25 celebrating 25 years of grant making but also marking 25 years of the internet so i think it's quite apt i guess so interesting rather to end with a reading of uh, exploring the absence of the internet so uh, amulya thank you a day in bhumi's boots 5 am deep winter the nanda devi is asleep her eyes opened into total blackness were they really open her limbs felt like lead she closed her eyes and opened them again there was no difference it was pitch black outside and pitch black inside and although bhumi knew she must be at home on her own bed there was no visual corroboration of this fact she floated for a while in the delicious uncertainty am i dead she thought is it finally over she waited and the answer came to her in the steady heaving of her chest what if i'm blind she thought next is there still a sky outside is it beautiful is it real to feel beauty is to be alive said her mother's voice from somewhere within the blackness the lamp by bhumi's bedside was an old rickety piece that she had foraged from the dehradun sunday market it produced a dim pool of light on the rust and mustard tapestry that used to decorate a wall in her mother's living room 8 years ago when bhumi had entered the childhood home she'd run away from it felt like she was stepping into her mother's skin it was everywhere her mother's voice it hummed and echoed and resonated from the walls and the floorboards her mother singing old bollywood songs her mother talking to the dogs her mother shouting for bahadur her mother had hoarded an astonishing amount of junk the house was a graveyard of memorabilia stones and seashells when had the woman gone to the beach and scraps of abandoned poetry bhumi boxed them indiscriminately and sent them all away to the rubble sale of the market she rolled up her sleeves dusting and scrubbing room after room with a vengeance till she had stripped the house to its very bones when she had reduced it to anonymity she stood back and considered it it was small in comparison to its vast surroundings the windows were tiny the ceilings too low she showed it to benji over a video call benji who longed to be by her side instead of building soulless skyscrapers in dubai help me make this my own benji she told him this will be my ithaca and so began the years of restoration and rebuilding that followed taking down walls raising ceilings adding wall to wall windows balconies verandas painting murals on the walls stripping carpets down to original deodar wooden floors building three new residential wings etc etc but this room bhumi's bedroom was the only one that was unchanged in an uncharacteristic fit of sentimentality bhumi decided to retain this part of the house as it was it's fitting benji had said it is after all a womb and you can't deny your mother that and so it came to be that the rest of bhumi's ethica was a fort but her bedroom was a womb 10 am nanda devi is speaking from above the clouds most days bhumi got out of bed with little fuss her muscles remembered what to do and she just followed them mornings in the mountains were busy 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 there was work enough to warm the bones bhumi welcomed it she lived for the morning bustle 
It was when she really inhabited her body, outside the words, in the doing of things. Each morning she cleaned, washed, sorted, baked, and quietly manifested her reality. Bhumi was spry for her age. Not so long ago, she had turned 45 in the quiet gaze of the Garhwal Himalayas. And then 46, 47, and now 52. Bhumi was a woman of remarkable strength, and she had been told that so many times, it felt like the rest of her music was drowning in its din. It started when she was 16. Born into the mountains, she had had to fight her way out of its monumental banality. She ran away from Dehra to Delhi, and then to Berlin, and then to New York, away from the small town, from the small mines and their small lives, away from her mother with her suffocating anxiety. And then 20 years later, her mother had died and Bhumi had returned. She had brought enough optimism from a new world to resurrect the guest facilities at the estate, make a website and breathe new life into the place, her inheritance. But this house had resurrected her 16 year old self intact from wherever it had lain buried all these years. She didn't know it then, but she had returned to her real inheritance, her mother's utter loneliness. 2 p.m. Nanda Devi is playing hide and seek. Bhumi had spent the last hour chopping, dicing, sorting, and braising a mean leg of lamb. It sat simmering satisfyingly in the pan, its aroma reaching straight into her innards and eliciting a rumble. But strangely, she found that she had no actual desire to eat. All she wanted to do was cook. Every day, she found she didn't want to stop cooking. She stopped for an instant, she would slip into a vortex of memories, nails, and misses. It would unlock the box tightly clamping down the past, and her eyes would glaze unregisteringly over hundreds of texts, photos, plans, stories, rapidly scrolling. She carried the pan with her cup of coffee to the dining area. It was just two years ago, wasn't it? She had launched a digital network to empower women in the village, carrying out small businesses, it was just a year ago that the, that the estate was full of guests and their incessant demands for pakoras and foot warmers and everything in between. Her phone was constantly buzzing. There had been hardly any guests this past year and none this season. A beam of afternoon light streamed into the dining room and tiny motes of dust danced in it. Jimmy came in wagging his tail and took his spot in the sun. She opened the back door and looked for Bahadur, but Bahadur was not there. Bahadur, she shouted into the void. Dur, dur, it echoed back at her from afar. Diggy and Benji bounded into the room. Kapi joined them. They sniffed each other's butts, saying hi, 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 and circled around her feet, tumbling over each other. She bent over and ruffled under Kapi's chin. And just like that, with no warning, Bhumi slipped out of her own grasp and slid into the void. A deluge seemed to pour out of her ribcage in gut-wrenching sobs. She fell to her knees and sobbed into the floor while the coffee cup tipped over. Pools of salt water and coffee made their way towards the cracks and into the damp underbelly of her mother's house. Benji and Kapi and Jimmy and Diggy barked and howled along with her in the bright afternoon air. 8 p.m. Ananda Devi is the sum of all your memories. The wind is sharp and nippy, small eddies darting around her ankles as Bhumi rocked contemplatively on her favorite chair on the porch. It was a little too cold to be outside, but she didn't mind. To feel the cold is a sign of life, her mother used to say. It's uncanny how one could be 52 and 16 at the same time, and on some days, all the years in between. In the last year, Bhumi had had enough time and space and isolation to watch all her past selves resurface. Her 22-year-old self obsessively read Sartre and Dawkins and Kamu, seeking validation in the intelligent words of others. Her 35-year-old self cleaned and scrubbed and sorted everything in the house like they were the only things she had any control over. Her 16-year-old self scoured her memories for something new to blame her mother for. Her 44-year-old self longed for Benji. His shoulders, his chest, his heartbeat, like they were shelter in the storm. 
Her seven-year-old self flung sticks in the air and ran behind the dogs, their barking and her laughter echoing in the valley. And her 52-year-old self sobbed on the kitchen floor about all the unfinished conversations. Like she did at this time every night, Bhumi reached for her phone and turned it on. A sharp white digital light pierced the night. Disk storage low, it warned. She had hoarded an astonishing amount of junk on this phone. The phone was a graveyard of memorabilia, bones, breath, and scraps of abandoned poetry. No new messages. There had been no new messages for a year now. She clicked on the familiar green speech bubble to open the WhatsApp chat. Talk soon, said Jimmy Boy on 30th December, 2020. Pops asked Kapi later the same day in response to an accidental string of gibberish. Happy New Year, assholes, said Diggy on the NY fam group. I'm tired, Bhumi. I can't do this anymore. It's shit here without you, said Benji from across the aching ward. It's shit here without you. A tiny photon of ache exited her throat and ricocheted across the valley, stinging her eyes. Bhumi switched off the screen, got off the chair, and went to bed. Um, thank you, Amulya, for sharing. Okay. I think with that, we will close. Um, if you want to listen to the other podcasts, you will see them in the post uh, when we share her video. So do, do go check out the other three stories. Thank you. Thank you so much.